Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm continuing on with Ian Juby's Complete Creation series, and I'm starting to have suspicions. I've been getting these videos from a channel called Wazulu, and they're all low quality, like 360p videos with audio bugs and everything. And usually in cases like that, where there are pretty severe-ish quality problems on a channel with some nonsense word as a name, it's just some rando uploading bootlegs. But I think Wazulu is actually Ian Juby's channel. Either that or whoever runs it has put a lot of effort into making it look that way. I don't know, this guy's kinda sus. Anyway, I know I said last time that I wasn't planning on going through all these videos and taking them in order, but this is actually the next one in the series. You see, he brings up Niagara Falls, and since I drive right past Niagara Falls on the regular and have had jobs where Niagara Falls is the view out the window, that caught my attention. So I couldn't bring myself to just skip a part where he hits so close to home in such a literal sense. So let's go! Hello again and welcome back. In the previous lecture we were looking at the surprising foundations in history of the creation evolution debate. Yeah, that is what you did. If you'll recall with me for a moment, to summarize, if every word that Ian Juby spoke was true, that would have no impact on the modern theory of evolution. However, his statements were full of half-truths, obfuscations, loaded language, and either ignorance or outright lies, depending on how you look at it. It was a half-hour video that could have been adequately responded to by my simply asking, so what? But that wouldn't have been interesting for you guys to watch, so I actually went through the whole thing. As I previously mentioned, Lyell spent himself traveling the world looking for evidence to back up his new history. Yeah, he did travel a lot after he wrote his book, but as with most scientists, he wasn't looking for evidence to back up his previously drawn conclusion, as creationists do. He was studying various aspects of geology and giving lectures. One of those places visited was Niagara Falls. Woo! Yeah! Niagara Falls! That's near where I'm from! In 1841. If you ever get the chance to visit the Niagara Falls, I highly recommend it. Just stay away from Clifton Hill, that place is a money pit. Though, the dinosaur mini putt with the fiery volcano is pretty fun. You can notice several significant things. Take the journey behind the falls, which are tunnels at the bottom of the falls and in behind. Do it on the Canadian side, though. You have to come to the Canadian side to get any of the good attractions, not to mention the better view. Anytime the falls shows up in movies and TV shows, they're always on the Canadian side, largely because of this. Besides spectacular scenery, when you are at the base of the falls, look in behind the falling water. Notice there is a bit of a cave forming behind the falls. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of rock involved here. There is a limestone layer at the top and shale at the bottom. Limestone is a fairly tough rock. It is actually the rock from which we get concrete. So think of it like concrete. The shale is a very soft, fine-grained sediment, which has basically been compacted together into a rock. Yeah, basically. And that combination is why we can say things like the falls erode backward at so many centimeters per year, when it doesn't actually look like it's going anywhere. Because it erodes the softer rock in the bottom, and then there will be a large rock slide as the harder limestone at the top crumbles over after the supporting shale is eroded away. As the falls continuously move backwards upstream towards Lake Erie, the Niagara Gorge is left behind. The falls and gorge started here at the Niagara Escarpment. Yes, this is a fact that is accepted by creationists as well. Niagara Falls is the force that carved the gorge, and the falls started at Queenston Heights, where this steep incline of the Niagara Escarpment was, and still is today. My point is, even creationists agree that the gorge has been carved by the falls over thousands of years. The dispute is over how many thousands of years. So when Lyell visited the falls, ye old gears in his head must have been turning. Here was the perfect clock that he could call upon. A modern day, observable, repeatable process that he could call upon in his book to bolster his new history. 
I don't really think so. I'm going to wait for you to get further into it before I bring up what Lyle actually wrote about the falls, but suffice it to say for now that he wasn't just looking for things that could make the Earth look old, he was simply making observations. You know, get an idea of how slowly the falls are moving backward over time, measure the length of the gorge, and extrapolate the age of the gorge by dividing the length of the gorge by the erosion rate. It's not quite as simple as that, and Lyle knew that it wasn't that simple, as we will soon see. So, in the name of proper and good science, did he study and measure the erosion rates over time you know, to get a good handle on the erosion rate? Himself? No, he was just visiting. However, he was working closely with American geologist James Hall, and Lyle assisted Hall with his work in being the first to conduct an accurate survey of the rim of the falls, which would then be used several times in the future to measure the erosion rate using specific landmarks from Hall's survey. So he may not have taken the measurements himself at the time, but he helped develop the map that would be used to take those measurements in the future. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, no, no. He instead asked the locals what they thought. Not really. I mean, yeah, he used one of Mr. Bakewell's calculations of one yard per year for the 40 years preceding 1830, but you make it sound like he just wandered up to some random local guy and said, hey, how fast do these falls move back? Which is absolutely not how it happened. Now, he did find one man who told him, well, I've been eyeballing a tree from this side to that tree on the other side of the gorge, and I'd estimated probably it'd be eroding at about, oh, three feet per year. I would be willing to bet that that's not a great description of how Bakewell performed his calculation, but I'll let it slide as I can't really find anything detailing exactly how he did perform the calculation. So, did Lyell use the locals' wild guess? In his book? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, no, no. That simply would not serve his secret purposes of refuting the biblical history in the minds of people and replacing history with his story. No, he assumed the local was exaggerating and wrote that the falls were eroding at one foot per year. Okay, now it's time to look at what Lyle himself wrote about this exchange. Mr. Bakewell calculated that in the 40 years preceding 1830, the Niagara had been going back at the rate of about a yard annually, but I conceived that one foot per year would be a much more probable conjecture, in which case 35,000 years would have been required for the retreat of the falls from the escarpment of Queenston to their present site, if we could assume that the retrograde movement had been uniform throughout. Well... Just this by itself does look a little bit damning. After all, he's admitting that it's conjecture, and that there is an assumption that the erosional rate was uniform. But let's just read a little bit further, shall we? This, however, could not have been the case, as at every step in the process of excavation, the height of the precipice, the hardness of the materials at its base, and the quantity of fallen matter to be removed must have varied. At some points it must have receded much faster than at present, at others much slower, and it would be scarcely possible to decide whether its average progress has been more or less rapid than now. Shocker of shockers, it turns out that scientists are often aware of situations that are not perfectly uniform indefinitely. Juby is presenting this as though Lyle must have thought that the recession rate of the falls was uniform, because Lyle promoted uniformitarian geology. Except, uniformitarian does not mean that all things are constant in the past. Lyle was perfectly aware that different situations would have a different result. Uniformitarianism is not a belief that all observable processes happen at the same rates indefinitely into the past regardless of any other variability, it's just that the processes that we see today would be the same processes that happened in the past, and they obey the same laws of nature that we see today. From there, it was simple math. He wrote that a 35,000 foot gorge eroding at one foot per year was 35,000 years old, and the Earth could not possibly be 6,000 years old. Well, as I pointed out, when you read it in Lyle's own words, he isn't trying to disprove creationism. Hell, he isn't even trying to give an accurate age for the falls. This was merely a guesstimation in a book recounting his travels in North America, not a scientific publication, essentially just a story. Yeah, the story included a back-of-the-envelope style calculation, but it is never presented as anything other than a conjecture, and no conclusions are drawn based on this number. You see, everyone in Lyell's day knew that, according to the biblical account, the earth was only around six to 10,000 years old. 
You know, I really wish creationists would stop making that sound like some indisputable fact. Like, the Bible doesn't actually say anything about how old the Earth is. That's a calculation based on genealogies found in the Bible and the assumption that Genesis is literal. It is a guesstimation that is no better than Lyell's guesstimation of a 35,000-year age for Niagara Falls. So Lyell once again put his cunning lawyer's tactic to use in his writing about the Niagara Gorge. He never mentioned the Bible. Why would he? He was studying geology. What does the Bible say about geology? Nothing. So why would he talk about the Bible in a book on geology? He simply used a modern day process in claiming that the gorge was 35,000 years old and the earth couldn't possibly be 6,000 years old. Well, you're talking about the story of an event that happened in 1841 as though it were printed in his book that was published in 1830. So I decided to look it up. Turns out, this story was added into one of his later editions of the book, and it's pretty much the same thing. With his back-of-the-envelope calculation, you'd get an age of 35,000 years, but he fully admits that this is a rough estimate and that better data would be needed to make a more accurate calculation. Everyone who read Lyell's book knew what he had just done. He flat-out refuted the Bible. I mean, he did, but not with Niagara Falls. Even though he never mentioned it. Yeah, it's funny how an unbiased presentation of facts, data, and evidence ends up refuting a literal interpretation of the Bible. Almost as though a literal interpretation of the Bible is not backed up by facts, data, and evidence. So, whose erosion estimate was right? Lyell's? Or the local man who claimed three feet per year? Doesn't matter. It is what it is, regardless of whether or not these two people, both of whom were working from bad data, ended up at a close-ish number with their calculation. I mean, really, as Lyle pointed out numerous times, the actual erosion rate would have varied. But if we just want to do back-of-the-envelope calculations, we know from other data that Niagara Falls is about 12,500 years old. It has moved a distance of about 11 kilometers in that time, giving us an average erosion rate of 88 centimeters per year, or 2.8 feet. So just by straight up looking at the average erosion rate, Bakewell was closer to being correct, but this turns out to be irrelevant because of the whole, you know, knowing its age from different methods thing. Well, as it turns out, neither. When actual, true science was conducted and the erosion rates were actually measured, the rates were discovered to be closer to five feet per year. I'd be interested to see where you figured that out, because what I'm finding is that the average rate of erosion from 1842 to 1905 was 1.16 meters per year, or 3.8 feet, and from 1906 to 1927 it was down to 70 centimeters per year, or 2.3 feet. And starting in 1906, we humans started building things specifically to combat erosion, not to mention diverting water for electricity generation, so the erosion rate has been much slower ever since. Point is, I have never seen an estimate anywhere close to five feet per year. Lyell convinced countless numbers of people around the world that this book was fiction. When in fact it was his science that was fiction. I just love the smug look on your face as you proudly proclaim a completely unjustified, Nuh-uh, it was you that wasn't being scientific. You could not even call Lyell's research flawed because he didn't do any research. His report was dishonest at best. Who is more dishonest? The guy who wrote plainly that his rough calculations were based on conjecture and could very well be wrong given the different circumstances that the river would have been in in the past? Or the guy who presents this rough calculation based on conjecture as though it were supposed to have been the definitive work on the matter when nobody was using it as such? And he had he accurately reported using actual erosion rates of the day, his extra extrapolation would have placed an age of about 7,000 years old on the gorge. Nope, not even close. Three feet is 91 centimeters. If it eroded 91 centimeters per year, then it would take 12,088 years to erode that distance. In order to fit with the creation model, where the falls would have had to have been created no earlier than 4,000 years ago, you have to be comfortable with a margin of error of 200%. Remember my last video when I was talking about reasons why creationist papers don't often get published in reputable journals? Stuff like this is why. Ask any scientist if a 200% margin of error is acceptable and see what their answer is. It would have been seen by readers as affirming the biblical history. I'm not sure how finding that a natural feature is three times older than it's possible for it to be if the Bible is accurate supports the Bible. 
I'm skipping a bit now. He rambles a bunch about Louis Hennepin, the first European to draw a picture of the falls. He takes a really long time to say that he went to the spot where Hennepin would have viewed the falls from, and he presents Hennepin's drawing of the falls looking very different than it does today, as evidence that the falls have eroded really, really quickly in recent times. I, I think. I think that's what he's going for. I'm not sure what conclusions he expects to be drawn from this, but just listen to how he talks about this drawing. Most historians have written off Hennepin's drawing as exaggerated and drawn years after the fact from memory. I don't know whether or not it was drawn years after the fact, and actually, I think it probably was, given that Hennepin's trip to the falls was in 1678, like Juby has displayed there, but the drawing wasn't published until Hennepin included it in his book, New Discovery, which was published in 1697, 19 years later. But regardless of whether it was drawn from memory or from him standing right there looking at it, it was most definitely exaggerated. Hennepin described the falls as being 600 feet tall, which, given its actual height of 177 feet, is a definite exaggeration. Unless you want to suggest that somehow the entire top of the gorge all eroded evenly with the falls over the last 300 years? Otherwise, there would be a rather steep incline there, which just doesn't exist. Hogwash! <laughs> the only reason they say that is because the falls in Hennepin's drawing do not look anything like they do today. I mean, it's really more that he described them with numbers that can't possibly be accurate. We know the falls look different. Lyle himself commented on the rocks of the falls collapsing in the early 1800s, giving the horseshoe a more pronounced curve. But sure, go ahead and pretend that we thought the falls of 300 years ago would have looked identical to today's falls if you want. It doesn't help your case, though. That is an El Lamo excuse to reject the accuracy of this drawing. So let me get this straight. You don't like that Lyle used an estimate given to him by the locals to base his estimated erosion rate on, all while being completely honest about the speculative nature of his estimations, because his ultimate source was just to talk to guys that were there. But you want to propose, as counter-evidence, a picture, possibly drawn almost two decades after Hennepin observed the falls, which describes the falls as being higher than it was possible for them to be. And that is good evidence, because what? Is it because you think it helps your case, whereas Lyle's observations do not help your case? That looks a lot like cherry-picking to me. Will he actually give an age for Niagara Falls so we can check his math? Will he ever even explain why a young Niagara Falls would automatically mean a young Earth? To find out, tune in tomorrow, same Rhino time, same Rhino channel.